Music. It's the love of music that brings us together. The love of music that forms the bond between us. For the next hour, join us for the love of music, presenting those aspects of music which excite, provoke, and inspire. Our host today is David Dubow, WNCN music director, pianist, educator, and writer on music. Here is David Dubow for the love of music. It is my great pleasure to have in WNCN studios John Corleano. John, you are very, very big in the art of music today. And again, it is not because you have had this week so many performances by the New York Philharmonic, of which you have had your share perhaps lately, but because you're in the newspapers literally as the star of a new movie called Altered States. Well, that's a great compliment. Would that be true? Actually, I did write the music for it, but the stars are quite remarkable. Really fine acting in it. And this is a Ken Russell... It's um, a Ken Russell movie, which means everything that you think it is. <laughs> he, he is an amazing man, and I'm looking forward to that film. But uh, when I was reading the New York Times, and I said to someone, my God, I haven't seen a composer get such credit in a long time. I mean a serious composer, a composer of so-called art music. This is quite superb, and I'm very pleased for your fellow composers as well. Well, thank you. That actually happened in an unusual way. Ken Russell went to the Los Angeles Philharmonic, and they were doing my clarinet concerto. Zubin Mehta was conducting it with Michelle Zukowski as soloist. And, you know, he's a music lover. He's got a record library that you wouldn't believe. I mean, it's like this library. He went and loved the piece, and he was doing Altered States at the time, and notified Daniel Melnick, who was the executive producer, and Howard Gottfried, the producer, that he wanted me to do the music. And they somehow agreed, very easily, he says, in fact, which surprised me a lot, and flew me out there, so that it was really the Schwab's drugstore scene in a uh, more sophisticated setting, in the sense that I was discovered at the Los Angeles Philharmonic concert. How fantastic. Serious music makes a great impact in film. Yeah, it does. In fact, the interesting thing about this movie and about my composing the score for it was that not only was I not restricted stylistically or told you know, to conform to any Hollywood standards, but I was encouraged to be very experimental because the movie, of course, Ken Russell being so experimental and the topic dealing with hallucinations and trips and drugs and all, they wanted a different kind of music. They wanted something that they didn't get out there, which is, of course, why they hired me. Mm -hmm. So when I came with music that was notated very often in strange manners, no one looked surprised or shocked, and they, in fact, were delighted with the results. And I had a whole different image of Hollywood in that respect, because I'd always heard about the sellout, but this was just the opposite. That's wonderful. You know, I hope that there's a lot of feedback, because this is a rather complex score, mm -hmm. and it was exciting for you to do. Now, will it have good currency on record? Yeah, I think it will. The record is being released by RCA. And, of course, like most records, it doesn't have the sound effects. It has the music. Soundtrack albums don't include the sound effects. We had the music conducted by Christopher Keene, who I think you must know of and mm -hmm. know his work. This is unusual in Hollywood also because, basically, the composers conduct their music. This is because they get paid more that way, mm -hmm. and they get a royalty that way, which they don't as composers. The only trouble with that was this music was very difficult music. And the way they record music there, they do not rehearse it, really, in the sense of actual rehearsing. They read it once or twice, and then they set it down. Uh -huh. And that's it. And then they go to the next uh -huh. cue, and the next cue. Which means that if you have them do unusual things, and I had my players playing in ways that they'd never played before, you really have to have someone who's expert at teaching them really fast how to do it, because time is of a real essence there. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but there are other problems besides just conducting, in the sense that you are queuing up to a movie. And you have to watch a huge screen, a 50-foot screen, way in the back of the orchestra, and they have streamers that go across the stream and pops to show you that that downbeat has to be exactly at that time. Fascinating. So the combination of skills is enormous, and I didn't think it was for me to do. But it was fascinating to just be there. Oh, yeah. Oh. I learned a lot. Now, Hinshi, Mushroom Dance, is our first work <laughs> that we are going to represent you, John Corleano, as composer on this program, of which you are obviously my guest, and... What is Hinshi? What's well, Mushroom Dance? I don't want to know. It's, okay, you don't want to know? <laughs> I wanna... it's, it's a wild dance, and actually it occurs about a third into the film. It's the second hallucination in which he goes down to Mexico to get these mushrooms. I suspected and, this. Yeah, and goes into that 
wonderful world of the extravaganza because it's really an extravagant, wonderful number with huge dancing natives and masks and fireworks and chariots taking off and spaceships taking off. And he's having this wild hallucination during all of it. And there are very explosive, almost like firework bursts and raining sparks down him as he races around during this hallucination. And I told Ken that I thought they should be pictured more in the music than actual sounds because it's a hallucination and they're more unreal if music depicts mm -hmm. them than if the sound effects men get to it mm -hmm. and actually make it real. And he agreed to that so that the bursts of fire and almost firework display of cascades of color you'll hear in the orchestra were dictated by the visual optical effects. Yeah. Then you'll hear nine timpani, which is, again, a luxury that can only happen in Hollywood, getting mm -hmm. nine timps on a stage. Wow. Nine timpani accompanying the wild mushroom dance. It's a lot of fun. It's wild and extravagant, and I think it works as a piece by itself. In fact, Chris is going to conduct next season Three Hallucinations from Altered States, a piece which I'm adapting from Very the score, good. and this will be the closing hallucination. So let's now hear John Corleano's Altered States from the film score. Hinchy, Mushroom Dance, and who would be the performers here? This, How would you? These are the best pickup musicians in Los Angeles. Which so is we have a now a performance by the pickup musicians <laughs> of Los Angeles conducted by Christopher Keene. Here we go. Altered States. From Altered States, John Corleano's Hinchy Mushroom Dance with 
really some pickup group. John, this is an extraordinary piece. Well, thank you. The performers are fantastic. I can tell you that I've never come across players like a horn player who can play up to his concert F 20 takes in a row, not tire his lip, and never crack once. I mean, they're extraordinary players. And we are going to have an extraordinary message. And right after this message, or perhaps two, we're going to hear the slow movement, much different in texture and design of your clarinet concerto. My guest, John Corleano, and we'll be right back. My guest is John Corleano, one of the very important and, I'm glad to say, young composers, because usually in, in American music, you don't become very important until older, which is a pity. Now, I say this because I just found out during our little intermission that this is your birthday. Right. Happy birthday, thank John. Thank you, thank you. And I think on anniversary concert it's represented. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a work very different than the film score, Altered States, Hinchy, and I'm sure you were not when you were composing that on any mushroom. No. No, you couldn't write like <laughs> <No>. that. <laughs> <laughs> but that, of course, is a whole interesting topic right there, but we don't have time today. But I want to talk about this concerto which is rather new now on the market, so to speak. Mm -hmm. This Tell recording is a brand new one, in fact, New World Records, and it's with Stanley Drucker, who did the premiere of the piece, and Zubin May to conducting the no, New York Philharmonic. He's a wonderful Philharmonic. artist, isn't he, a clarinetist? Oh, he's of, amazing. Uh -huh. He really is. I wrote this piece specifically for Stanley and the Philharmonic. It was a commission. Francis Gillett has this whole bunch of commissions he had for various solo instruments and orchestra, and I was lucky enough to get the clarinet and Stanley, which to me are the same thing, <laughs> and Leonard Bernstein did the premiere of it. And this was a very important piece for me because, well, it was the hardest thing I ever wrote in my life, the biggest challenge I ever had because, as I'm sure you know, my father was concert master of the Philharmonic for yes, indeed. 24 years, and I grew up with that orchestra. So it was a challenge for me to write for that orchestra and for the conductor, who I knew when I was growing up because Bernstein's more than 10 years as music director were when my father was concertmaster. Yes. And Stanley was in the orchestra at that time. Even though he looks very young, he was in the orchestra as first clarinet from the age of 18. Mm. So he's been there a long time. So I took it as a real challenge and built the piece, basically, on my feelings about the orchestra, the soloist, my father, who died in 1975, and Bernstein. And each movement reflects an aspect of that so that the slow movement became immediately, for me, an important movement in which I would pay a tribute to my father as concertmaster of that orchestra. And it's a clarinet concerto, so of course the clarinet is the soloist. But the very first thing I wrote was not the clarinet line. It was the duet between the clarinet and the solo violin. And I knew that that was going to be a part of that piece, and it shaped the mood of loneliness and the whole attitude of the movement so that when it comes in, it really was the first thing written, even though it climaxes the movement. The first movement is a study of wild virtuosity called Cadenzas for mm -hmm. Stanley, and the last movement, Antiphonal Toccata, deals with Bernstein's incredible theatricality. Mm -hmm. It has instruments scattered around the hall, it uses fractions of Gabrielli, and it comes to quite a climax. But the second movement is a study in a kind of removal and loneliness, because my father was a kind of man, he was a wonderful violinist and a wonderful man, and he had a lot of trouble talking to people. Mm -hmm. And when he wanted to be close to me, he would play the violin. He would say, come, I want you to hear what I'm practicing, and then we'd discuss it. And it was really, the only way we could really speak seriously was to start out that way. And I knew that only through playing that instrument did he really open up to people. So the piece begins in a very lonely way. It is stark. It's not full and rich. And when the violin comes in, it pulls the clarinet ahead always to try to reach a statement. And then finally the two of them sing together only once. And then the clarinet ends the movement. And it's in memory of my father. Then let's hear the middle movement of your new clarinet concerto with Stanley Drucker as the soloist and the orchestra. The orchestra is the New York Philharmonic. And the violinist, by the way, is Sidney Harth on this recording. Mm -hmm. Great violinist. Yes, indeed. Let's now hear Corleano's middle movement of the new clarinet concerto.
That was a beautiful performance of the clarinet concerto performed by Zuban Mehta in the New York Philharmonic and Sidney Harth was the violinist, the violinist in this almost like a duet with and Stanley Drucker. With yes. Stanley Drucker and this is a most moving slow movement and right after these messages we'll have more music by my guest John Corleano, American composer. This is David Dubal and John Corleano is my guest. You like very much composing for various instruments. You're already adding to the concerto literature with the piano concerto, a clarinet concerto, and the oboe concerto, which was heard widely all over. Are you a concerto person? I think I am, yes. I've just finished a flute concerto also for James Galway. It's a fantasy hmm. based on the Pied Piper of Hamelin, and it's going to be done next year. I love the concerto form. I think I grew up with it. Mm -hmm. You see, when I was a kid, my mother and I would sit in the green room of Carnegie Hall backstage as my father played the concerto with the Philharmonic as concertmaster. He did that every year. And we knew the pieces backwards. And we went through all the kinds of agonies that happen to someone who's out of control, can control what's happening, but knows the dangers ahead. And we'd sort of shudder and bury our heads just before a difficult passage and then look at each other after we made it. And we were listening to all of that on tiny little speakers backstage. So the tension of the virtuoso concerto is something that I grew up with. It was a part of me. I knew the notes, the problems, the excitement, mm -hmm. and the contest element of the form. And I think that that has helped me a lot in the writing of concertos. I had an attitude of, in terms of soloist versus orchestra that has worked pretty well for me. It's the romantic attitude of the soloist as king. You're, yeah. you're very interested in the idiomatic possibilities of each instrument, the resources of each instrument. Right. And I am, especially in instruments that haven't been written for that much. I think that today a composer can serve a great purpose by writing for some of the less popular instruments, yeah. like the oboe and the clarinet, the flute, which is fairly popular right now, but there's not a wealth of literature. No. Because we don't have the great 19th and 18th century composers having written for the flute. No, Mozart not. wrote a flute concerto, yeah. but we don't have any Beethoven or Brahms or any of the No staples. Tchaikovsky, none, none of Tchaikovsky. them. Tchaikovsky. Yeah. So really, today's composer, and this is one reason I like it also, can serve a valid function in today's music. Yes. Very often we question why we're doing it in the first place, you know, because there's such a wealth of greatness around us, as you have, and you just walk past those libraries and see the great music there. And what purpose can we serve? I think that's a very good purpose. I think we can enrich the literature of instruments that need enriching. I, I've always wanted, for example, to write a French horn concerto. I think that instrument is spectacular mm -hmm. in its capabilities. And you will, John. Oh, well, I guess I will someday. I think so. <laughs> I see that gleam in the eye right. when you speak of it. Now, of course, the piano literature has had many concertos, and this was really your first yeah. big-time virtuoso concerto. My first big piece, too. Really. We're going to hear the smallest little movement of it. As Brahm said of his scherzo of his piano concerto, a tiny, tiny wisp of a scherzo. Right. We're going to hear Hilda Sommer performing the scherzo from your piano concerto. And what's the orchestra? San Antonio Symphony, Victor Alessandro. And here it is.
And that was the tiny, tiny wisp of a scherzo, one of the four movements of this half-hour piece by John Corleano, Hilda Homer, who died this last season, was the soloist and the San Antonio Orchestra. John, this is the little insect world going on. I yeah. mean, it's almost choreographic. Perhaps you thought of the dance. You know, the first movement has been choreographed. I didn't know. And was a Pennsylvania Ballet does it as a ballet. I wrote this because of the hyper intense quality of the first and third movements, and I wanted something kind of cool and fragrant, bubbly, to go in between them. So actually it was inserted because of the big shape of the piece. I mm -hmm. needed some relaxation from the intensity because the third movement begins terribly intense and if it were the second movement following the intense first movement mm -hmm. it would have been too much. This was a little cooling off scherzo. <laughs> and now we will cool off from this scherzo with a message and here is our announcer and we will be back with more conversation and music. In fact a real tournament by John Corleano, my guest today whose birthday it is. And we are back. John, Tournaments is an early work by you. It's actually my first piece for large orchestra. And I wrote it in 1965. But I didn't get to hear it till last year. Because, oh, wow. Well, I mean... <laughs> I'll tell you the problem with the piece. It's a difficult piece. And yet it's a very light and happy piece. It's also a little long to be an overture, even though I call it an overture. Mm -hmm. It's not as long as Coriolanus or some of the large overtures of Beethoven. But it is still a pretty long overture. It's 11 and a half minutes long. And That's so, as big as any big Rossini overture, yeah, that we? Yeah, it's a long overture, mm -hmm. and it's tough, tricky rhythmically. So when Louisville, uh, Sidney Hearth called me, who was conducting Louisville, and asked for a piece, I said, well, I happen to have a piece that I've had in the back of my closet for some time. And I was delighted to go out there and hear a first-rate performance. Sidney is, in addition to playing violin unbelievably, as he did in the Clarinet Concerto. Concerto, he's also a first-rate and really wonderful conductor. And he recorded tournaments, overture, and elegy, for Louisville, and it's just been released. Is that on Louisville's label? Yes, it is. Yeah. That's a wonderful orchestra doing an extraordinary oh, job. It's amazing to go down there and see that and realize that most of the people in that orchestra have full-time jobs doing other things and come at night and perform contemporary music so well. I mean, the idiomatic qualities of this performance are sensational. I mean, they didn't have to have anything explained to them in terms of style. They understood it perfectly. They played it wonderfully, and Andy Kasdan did a terrific job mm -hmm. recording it, so I was very delighted when I got a test pressing and put it on. It's a happy, buoyant piece in three sections. The first section introduces a chorale, which is the material for the whole piece. Mm -hmm. The second section turns the melody of the chorale upside down and becomes a kind of waltz. And in the third section, the chorale comes back under a wild, mysterioso and furioso section of string writing and ends the piece in a blaze. And now the blaze begins in tournaments by, and it's your first major work, 1965, just recorded on the Louisville label, Louisville Orchestra, and Sidney Harth is the conductor, tournaments by John Corleano.
Cindy Harth in a magnificent performance of Tournaments with the Louisville Orchestra by my composer today, John Corleano, on his birthday. We have really talked about nothing about your career, really. We've, we've been playing a lot of music, and there's so much to say about the music that you're just going to have to come back at a future date with more music and more about you, because we just didn't get to talk delighted, about delighted. you. Delighted, delighted. We have another concerto coming up here, and it is really the most popular of your concertos because it's played everywhere, the oboe concerto. Right. Well, it's also a bit older than the clarinet concerto, therefore it's had some time to get around. Mm -hmm. And it's a happy, it's a fun piece, it's a happy piece, because the person I wrote it for, Bert Lucarelli, has oh. a very happy spirit. And as I write for people, 
who play instruments. The concerto ended up with that zany, happy spirit. So the first movement, in fact, begins with the oboe tuning the orchestra, and from the tuning, he begins a tuning game movement. And so the piece goes. There are two serious movements, mm -hmm. but there are five movements in the piece, and most of them are high-spirited. You're not into writing the three-movement bit. You like four one and five. Concerto. The clarinet yeah. is the only one that has three movements. And they're big movements. Yeah, they're big movements. But the last movement of this oboe concerto is a very strange movement, and it occurred because when I was in Morocco, in Marrakesh, and I went there on a trip back from Rome with a free stopover when those things were possible, mm -hmm. I went out into the square, and I saw Snake Charmer with his cobras, and, of course, a little band of musicians accompanying them, and they were playing the traditional instruments of Morocco, and one of them was a rieta, which is an Arabic wooden oboe, and it has a fantastic sound, full of microtones and a very heady ugly, beautiful sound, coarse and wonderful. And I was looking at the performer to see how he got that sound, and it seemed easier than you could believe, because he had the double reed of the oboes inserted into a plastic disc about the size of the old silver dollars, and that was the base of the oboe. And the way he played the instrument was he put his lips against that disc and blew his cheeks out and blew as hard as he could into the double reeds. Therefore, his lips didn't touch anything that vibrated. Now, because of that, there's a wonderful lack of control of the sound. It wavers. It, as I said, it has microtones in it. It's a very coarse, wonderful sound, much like the ancient primitive oboes. Now, today's Western oboist has worked an entire lifetime not to make that sound, mm -hmm. but instead to place his lips on the reed and shape the sound. So in this last movement, Rieta dance, I had to force my soloist at first, but he grew to love it, mm -hmm. to place his lips on the string of the reed that binds the two reeds together, but not on the reeds themselves, and blow his cheeks out and play. And that produced a completely different sound, the rieta sound. And so this whole last movement is kind of a happy-go-lucky Arabic fantasy with two subsections in it, one of them in which we do sort of an oriental, which is going to kind of the Arabic world via Paris, mm -hmm. which is very elegant. And then the dance resumes. And then at the very climax of the dance, and this is impossible, by the way, to play on records, but in real life it occurs, the orchestral oboist rebels against this incredible, horrible sound being made by the soloist and starts to interrupt the concerto with a beautiful melody which, in which he totally ignores the orchestra and the soloist and tries to show the soloist what a beautiful oboe sound is. The soloist tries to engage that oboist into the rieta dance and slowly he draws the orchestral first oboe into the dance so the two of them end together. It's kind of fun when you see it on the stage because there's always a feud between the first desk players and the soloist, unspoken but real, and this sort of brings it out into light. I might add that part of the strange sound in the orchestra is the fact that the cellos, when they play, are doubled by a kazoo, which adds an edginess to their sound and provides a kind of Arabic spirit to the whole thing. Well, Bird is the soloist in this performance, and Kazuyashi Akiyama is conducting the American Symphony Orchestra. Here is the last movement of John Carliano's Oboe Concerto. <laughs> Thank you. 
Bert Lucarelli is an extraordinary oboe player, isn't he? Certainly is. Fantastic. We just heard the last movement of your oboe concerto, and on our next program that we have with you, we'll be hearing your wonderful, wonderful major work for piano, Etude Fan... What is it Etude called? Fantasy. Which James Toko played in New York a couple of seasons ago, which is an amazing piece. We're going to have to leave now. I'm going to have to say to you, happy birthday. Keep composing, because you're very necessary, and good luck with everything this year. Thank you. Bye, John. And this is David Dubois, and thank you for listening. For the love of music, with today's host, David Dubois, WNCN Music Director. We hope you'll be with us when once again we meet to listen and exchange ideas, all for the love of music. For the Love of Music is produced by WNCN New York, GAF Broadcasting Company. <laughs>